Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you, God, that you are here, that you open up our ears, our eyes. Lord God, you open up our hearts and our minds to receive the message tonight, Lord God. Give us grace. Give me grace, Lord God, to say what you want me to say, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. We are on the church of Thyatira. All right. Revelation 2. Verses 18 all the way to 29. Jesus is writing and he says, Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira, the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze, says, I know your works, your love, your faithfulness, service, and endurance. Your last works are greater than the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my slaves to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her practices. I will kill her children with the plague then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts. I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who haven't known the deep things of Satan, as they say, I do not put any other burden on you. But hold on to what you have until I come. The one who is victorious and keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. And he will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my father, I will also give him the morning star. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So we have ears. So we're going to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This old guy, G.K. Chesterton, said, Tolerance is the virtue of the man without convictions. Tolerance is the virtue of the man without convictions. So Jesus says, I know your works, your love, your faithfulness, your service, and your endurance. Your last works are greater than the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Some people would say that Christians are intolerant. And some Christians would say that others are intolerant of us. Tolerance is an assumed virtue. If you don't hold to an open, tolerant view, where you agree with, support, and embrace everyone and everything, then you're bigoted. They call you a bigot. Well, if you don't agree with all of this stuff, then you're a bigot. You're narrow-minded, you're discriminatory, you're prejudiced, you're outdated. See, tolerance is a cancer that once it enters into a church, it causes it to become a corrupt church. And the church of Tyratira was a corrupt church. He says, I have this against you, you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. So she calls herself a prophetess. She was a spiritual leader that God didn't appoint. But she appointed herself. She took her own liberty and said, I will be the leader. And then she starts teaching and seducing the servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. And Jesus says, I gave her time to repent, but she don't want to. So Jezebel is a type of person, and that, it isn't actually the Jezebel from the Old Testament, okay? Because then she'd be like way, way old, a lot old, like way old. So it's a type of person who acted like her, kind of like a Judas, a traitor. The actual woman Jezebel lived in the Old Testament in the days of Elijah. And she was a very powerful woman. 1 Kings 16, 30-33. But Ahab, son of Omri, 
did what was evil in the Lord's sight more than all who were before him. Then, as if following the sin of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, were a trivial matter, he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And then he proceeded to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Ahab and Jezebel's reign over Israel is one of the saddest chapters of history of God's people. They did so much evil while they were in that position of authority. See, Jezebel, a Jezebel will rise when there is an Ahab. And Ahab is a man who is a weak leader. And Ahab is a man who is a weak leader who is easily seduced by women, who has a lax view on sin, who gives in to sexual immorality, and who is most often into sexual immorality himself. Ahab's lax view on sin led to the rise of of Jezebel. Stuart, y'all just had a baby. Pretty sure they had some babies born, some little girls. Or is any one of them named Jezebel? <laughs> you would know. I mean, you would know. I went to school. Everybody here went to school. Have y'all ever went to school with somebody named Jezebel? That's how wicked of a chick this is. That nobody would ever name their kid Jezebel. I know somebody who named their kid Lucifer, but not Jezebel. I don't think anybody in the history has ever named their kid Jezebel. That's how wicked of a chick this is. And it takes an Ahab for her to rise. See, Ahab's view was so laxed on sin, so laxed on sexual immorality, he was so seduced by her that he basically let her do whatever she wanted. See, Jezebel would have had no influence on Israel without Ahab allowing her to have the influence she did. Every Jezebel needs an Ahab. Both to establish credibility and to give in to their need to exercise dominion. The story of Jezebel was found in First and Second Kings. We don't have time to go through all that. I'm going to put it to you like this. I have nine pages of notes. It started off at 20. I had to condense it down so we, for time's sake. So she was the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of Tyre Sidon, and the priest of the cult of Baal. A cruel, sensuous, and revolting, revolting false god whose worship involves sexual degradation and lewdness. Ahab was the king of Israel. He married Jezebel and led the nation into Baal worship. So she starts with Baal worship. And what it is is basically a compromised faith. It's a hyphenated faith, a diluted faith. It's a compromised faith. It's a both slash and faith. Okay? When Jesus said it's either or. See, false religions always add to the message of Jesus. See, over here, I teach Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. False religions say, or I call it false demonations. It's not denominations. Because you can't say, oh, that's a false denomination. And it's, you know, or, or, well, this denomination of Christianity teaches this. It's not a denomination. It's a demon nation. Because it's a doctrine of demons that runs it. And it always adds to the gospel. It says Jesus is not enough. His work on the cross was not sufficient. His blood isn't enough. They're always adding to the saving work of Jesus. It says you need Jesus and works to be saved. 
You need Jesus and speaking in tongues. You need Jesus and baptism. You need Jesus and penance. You need Jesus and purgatory. You need Jesus and living holy to be saved. All you need to be saved is the blood of Jesus. That's it. Anytime you add anything to it, you have moved away from true religion, for a lack of better words, into a false one. So now there's a woman like that in the church at Dyrathera many, many years later after the original Jezebel was there. Now we don't know if she started off as an official leader of the church. We don't know if it was just the spirit of Jezebel at work in the church. We don't know. You know, but all we do know is that she was influential and she was powerful. And she was causing division. So Jesus was most likely referring to a woman in the church who influenced it in the same way Jezebel had influenced Israel into idolatry and sexual immorality. And Jesus declares that woman is not to be tolerated. But y'all have been tolerating her. And then she refused to repent of her immorality. She refused to repent of her false teaching and her fate was sealed. Lord Jesus cast her onto a sick bed along, to all, along with all of those who committed idolatry with her. See, because the end for those who succumb to a Jezebel spirit or a Jezebel um, teaching or whatever you want to call it is always death and destruction, both in the physical and the spiritual sense. Now, the Greek word there for Jezebel is a synonym for a false teacher. If you take that in Revelation, break it down into Greek, it's a synonym for a false teacher. So her name started off as, I should have put it all in there. But anyway, it started off good, and at the end, it ended up being a bad word, okay? So she clearly represents false doctrines, all right? Jesus clears it up by continuing... In Revelation 2.24, he says, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, you haven't known the deep things of Satan, as they say, I do not put any other burden on you. So here is a group of God's people full of good works and charity, having a form of faith and patience and, and doing all the good stuff. They were doing all that is good and commendable. But then there is something very dangerous going on at the same time. Something so seductive that Christ warns that he will send judgment and make them an example to all the other churches. Certain members of the church were selling out to Satan. Their good works, charity, service, faith, and patience were being overshadowed by a seduction of false doctrine. They were under the spell of a false teaching a teaching that came in disguised as the true word, but was in fact evil. See, deception always comes in as the true word of God. Because if it would come in under anything else, then it wouldn't be deception. Right? 1% off of something is wrong. A half truth is a lie. See, the devil don't come in and just do a full blown lie. Because then you know it's a full blown lie. He'll come in and he'll mix stuff in it, he'll mix some truth into it. That's why it's hard to uh, discern deception a lot of times. So we could call what she did basically, it's a doctrine of demons. Jesus made. Jezebel's name synonymous with false doctrine. It is a doctrine which teaches that something evil can be good. With something that is profane be pure. There are multitudes of people, pastors, teachers, preachers, evangelists, completely under the seductive spell of a Jezebel. Those seduced teachers are in turn producing children of seduction. They teach fornication and the consumption of the food of idols. 
is basically a spiritual fornication. This is eating the, denom the, the demonic food of doctrines that excuse sin. How many of you know it's dangerous to sit and eat their own teaching? Very dangerous to sit and eat their own teaching. False doctrine condemn you more easily than all the lust and the sins of the flesh combined. I think false preachers and false teachers are sending more people to hell than any other false religion. Multitudes of blind, misled Christians are singing and praising the Lord in churches enslaved by false doctrine. And when you try to talk to them, they're like, that's my church. You can't talk bad about my church. They love me. They love, they love Jesus over there. It's like, yeah, which Jesus they love. They're just not the one in the Bible. See, thousands of people are sitting in the teachers who are pouring out the doctrine of demons. And they come away like this. Wasn't that wonderful? I feel so encouraged and uplifting. It just really spoke to my soul today. And just, wow, I just feel so good about myself. I don't feel any conviction at all. Pastor so-and-so, he never preaches a sermon that makes you feel convicted. I heard that. I love our church. Really, that's great. Yeah, Pastor so-and-so, he just preaches these positive and uplifting sermons and you don't feel convicted at all over there. Run. Run. The Holy Spirit's first job is to convict you of sin. Not to make you feel good about yourself. See, Christ doesn't take this matter lightly. He always calls pastors and elders to warn, to expose. To save his people and his servants from terrible seduction. And like I said earlier, we better get serious about it. You have to be serious about where you go to church. You have to get serious about who you're listening to. What you pop on the radio. Don't be a spiritual goat and just eat anything. Be a spiritual sheep. The teaching that has your heart has your eternity. So if you like getting your ears tickled, the flames are going to tickle you when you go to hell. God's people are selling out to Satan on every side by giving themselves into the hands of false teachers and pushers of false doctrine. One of the main jobs of a pastor is to warn the sheep of wolves, of false teaching. Paul has a word to those who are pastors and who aspire to be a pastor. If you cannot or will not refute those who contradict it, then you should not be a pastor. Now, God does not want shepherds to be belligerent and walking around all the time with a theological chip on their shoulder, ready to jump on every little thing. But if you're the kind of person that always strings back from conflict, either because you're afraid or you don't want to risk offending people, what should you say about the Catholics? You might offend them. Well, the Catholics offend me. They offend me whenever they say that justification through faith. Let those who teach that justification through faith, let them be a curse. Let them be damned to hell. That offends me.
That offends me a lot. Because I teach justification by faith, so does Paul. So Paul the Apostle is damned to hell, according to the Catholic faith. So is me. And so is everyone in, of you in this room who listen to me. Does that offend you? That a whole, a whole religion says that you're damned to hell, that you're an anthema? Watch what you say. Why don't they watch what they say about the Lord? Why I got to watch what I say? I say what the Bible says. Watch what you say about the oneness Pentecostals. Why? They don't watch what they say about us. They say if you baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your baptism is null and void. That's true. It says if you don't, if you're not baptized by a oneness Pentecostal minister, you're not saved. They say if you don't pr pray in tongues, you're not saved. So we all going to hell. According to them, it doesn't offend you. It offends me. When they say that everything that I teach is false and fake. Or how about whenever a oneness Pentecostal preacher walk, walks into a meeting full of mixed pastors and say, Hey, I got a new one for you. If it's once saved, always saved. And once lost, always lost. It don't offend you. It offends me. Pretty sure it offends Jesus too. See, you can't be the kind of person that strings back from conflict. You can't be afraid to speak the truth because I might offend somebody. What about you might set somebody free? See, if you always shrink it back from the conflict that sound doctrine brings, then you're not qualified to be a pastor. And I would almost say you're not really qualified to be a Christian. Because part of the, being a Christian is the Great Commission, making disciples. And it also says for you to be ready to give an account for what you believe. See, as long as false teaching exists in the world, you must be willing to meet its challenge and defend the faith, defend what you believe. Titus 1.9 says, holding to the faithful message is taught so that he will be able to both encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. Titus 3.10 and 11 says, Reject the divisive person after a first and second warning, knowing that such a person is the perverted and sins, being self-condemned. So a lot of people say, well, pastor, that's your job. No, nope. confronting false teachers is not only the, the responsibility of the pastor, it's the responsibility of everyone who calls himself a Christian. Amen. <clears throat> so what are churches to do when false teachers from outside a congregation exert an influence within the congregation? The Apostle Paul addresses such a scenario in 2nd and 3rd John. He says in 2nd John 1, 7 and 9, he says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world that do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourself so you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. Saying anything that you add to Christ's teaching does not have God. Remember what I just said? False religion adds. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. John says that the congregation has a responsibility to refuse all support for false teachers. Moreover, the congregation must not behave in any way that might indicate endorsement of their false teaching. 2 John 1, 
If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and don't say welcome to him for the one who says welcome to him shares in his evil works. So if a teacher, a true Bible teacher gets up from behind the pulpit and says, hey, look, this is false teaching. This teacher is a false teacher. And you go home and you go, I don't care what that pastor or that preacher or that teacher says. That's my favorite teacher. I'm still going to do it. It says, to him shares in his evil works. So you're just like that person. Condoning a false teacher is the same sin as being one. Or we could do like I said last you know, Sunday. And just Let's just rip this out the Bible. Either the false teachers are wrong or the Bible's wrong. They can't be both right. Brother, we got to tolerate and love everyone. Really? Isn't that what Jesus is saying to this church? You tolerate a person who brings in false teaching, therefore your church is corrupt. See, the only teachers whom the church is supposed to support are those whose teaching is in accordance with the standard of divine truth. For all others, we must be clear about our rejection of their dangerous teaching. Because listen, anything, and then this is why you got it, this is why the Bible is serious about it. And this is why I take such a strong stance about it. Because if you add anything to salvation, you send that person to hell. If it's not faith in Jesus Christ alone, if it's not by grace that you are saved, guess what? It's not true salvation. If they say, hey, you got to have this and that. It's not only faith in Jesus that you have to have. You have to have purgatory. You have to have tongues. You have to have whatever. Guess what? That's going to send someone to hell. That's why it's so clear. Don't even, don't even endorse their false teaching. So we got to be clear about our rejection of their dangerous teaching. This not only applies to those whom we give our money, it also applies to those Christians that we must be willing to extend the hand of fellowship to outside of our church. We must be careful not to imply through our associations with false denominations and religions that we agree with their false teachings. Now, if you don't come to this church, is your teaching rebuking with authority, speaking and exhorting you to forsake sin and lay down all the idols as he is instructed to? Are you learning to hate your sin passionately? Or do you leave church not convicted? Can you go out clinging to all your little pet sins? I hear so many people say, our pastor says, I'm not here to preach against sin. I'm here to uplift Jesus. I heard one pastor say this. None of that con con condemning preaching from this pulpit. I'm here to lift all the fears and all the depression out of my people. So what are we doing if we're not preaching against sin? I asked that to a preacher one time. He said, well, you just preach Jesus. It's like, well, Jesus preached against sin. So if we don't preach against sin, then we'll be preaching a very short message every week. And the same thing over and over again. Because Jesus preached against sin. Jesus also rebuked false teachers.
See, the mark of a Christian seduced by Jezebel is that he is always seeking some new, different, or strange teaching. The Bible warns us in Hebrews 13, 9, Don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings. For it's good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food, since those involved in them have not benefited. See, do not be driven to this and driven to that and taken from a place and, taken and going to this place. Now, was this, what, what this is saying is, okay, and what I'm trying to say is, it's not, I'm not talking about the rare times where, you know, you, you have a mature believer and they go to hear a true man of God preach Christ and preach repentance. And, you know, you go hear a speaker somewhere, a guest speaker, you go hear something. Or sometimes God does move a person out of a church and moves them to another church. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those whose motives are always trying to find the next best, greatest thing. That's the motive behind it, okay? See, speaking of running from place to place, seminar to seminar, convention to convention, church to church, miracle healing service after miracle healing service. Having no roots somewhere where their ears are always itching to hear something new, something sensational, something entertaining, something pleasing to their flesh. That's how I, most people that I, that I have been around in some circles, that's how they are. They're always looking for something to appease their flesh and tickle their ears and and they're always itching for something new, something entertaining. What they, call, what they are are pleasure seekers riding the winds of every kind of doctrine that flies their way. People like that usually don't stay at a church that refuses to scratch itching ears. They'll come for a service too, and you don't see them again. Because they want to be stroked, not rebuked. They want to be, it's okay. Or they want to be shatty, baby, it's okay. <laughs> you can stay the way you are. So what they do is they come, they say, hey, he didn't tickle me. He didn't, he didn't tickle my ear. He didn't make me feel good about myself. So I'm going to go back to my old teacher. I'm going to go back to that old soothsayer, the happy positive thinker. And here's a message that they won't convict me so I can stay the way I am and feel good about that I went to church that morning. See, Jezebel represents false doctrine. The Bible states that it was not enough that Ahab had a heart bent towards sin, idolatry, and compromise. He brings it into... His life, a satanic influence that will confirm him in his sin. 1 Kings 21, 25 says, Still, there was no one like Ahab who devoted himself to do what is evil in the Lord's sight because his wife Jezebel incited him. See, that message is that the tendency of Christians who like to hold on to secret sin and secret lust is to embrace and become married to a false doctrine that will only excite and confirm them in their sin. The last thing Ahab needed was a Jezebel. He was already evil. He was already doing secret things. The last thing he needed was a wife like Jezebel that incited him to do even more. She brought out the worst in him. She magnified it and it destroyed Ahab. And that's the same thing with false doctrine. If there's any sin, any lust, any worldliness in you, the last thing you need is a doctrine that will bring out your worst. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he did not need a false prophet with a soothing message to tell him how much God loved him. He needed a strong prophet like Nathan that said, You that man! You're the one that's doing evil. You need to repent. You need those who preach the doctrine of Christ. 
that show the difference between evil and good. Where there is no mixture from their lips. Ezekiel 44, 23 says, They must teach my people the difference between the holy and the common. And explain to them the difference between the clean and the unclean. See, Ezekiel denounces false prophets who enrich themselves by bringing a message excusing sin. Ezekiel 22, 25, 28, he said, The conspiracy of her prophets within her is like a roaring lion tearing its prey. They devour people, seize wealth and valuables, and multiply the widows within her. Her priests do violence to my instruction and profane my holy things. They make no distinct, distinction between the holy and the common. And they do not explain the difference between the clean and the unclean. They disregard my Sabbaths. And I am profaned among them. Her officials within her are like wolves, tearing their prey, shedding blood, and destroying lives in order to make a prophet dishonestly. Her prophets plaster with whitewash for them by seeing false visions and lying divinations. And they say, this is what the Lord God says when the Lord has not spoken. You ever been into one of those services with a prophet liar? I never read. When a prophet came to town, that everybody go, Ooh, the prophet's coming. The prophet's coming. I'm going to get a word from the Lord. When the prophets came to town, the kings went, Oh, crap. <laughs> what does he want? Because they knew that when the prophet came, the Lord was getting ready to speak. And the prophet always preached repentance. Always preached repentance. He always brought, hey, you're doing evil. You need to repent or the Lord is going to destroy you. Have your choice. They never came. Brother, you're doing good and the Lord's going to bless you. Tenfold, a hundredfold, thousandfold coming to you. Money coming to you now. Plant this seed. One seed of a thousand dollars will give you back a, a tenfold $10,000. Harvest. <laughs> Sister Brandy, the Lord just told me, open up your checkbook and write to me a check for $99.76 and the Lord's going to bless you tenfold. <laughs> Bullcrap. Me and false prophets don't get along. Because I call him out. And Casey's always squeezing my hand, don't do it. I said, if they come to me, and I said, and if it's not confirmation, and if it's something off the wall, I'm calling them out. It's funny whenever it happens. But you look like the bad guy. <laughs> you coming against the man of God. <laughs> Touch not God's anointed. It's like, hey, moron, we're all anointed. <laughs> Don't touch me either. <laughs> See, and because of that, we have, a, we have whole churches full of mixed up people who cannot even recognize evil when they see it. When the truth is told to them, they call it a lie. Right. If I sit there and I say, this is what this false denomination, this false demonization, this false religion says. This is what the Bible says. You're lying. Or they get mad and they go back to that false religion. And it's like, I just showed you in scripture where I just refuted your whole thing. Why are you mad at me? You're lying. No. The Bible says what it says. But they're so used of, of being taught evil and being taught all this stuff that when the truth comes, they don't even know it. You know how they, 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 they teach bank tellers to, to know what counterfeit money is? Not by giving them false money all the time. By making them play with real money all the time. 
So whenever the false money comes in, they'll know, oh wait, this don't feel like this. This is the false one. But this is what happens in modern day Americanized Christianity. We fed all this all the time. We fed the false all the time. That when the real comes in, you're like, wait, they don't feel like this. So this must be, this must be false. It's like, no, 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 no. This is the real. See here, false teaching, false teaching, especially in America, is more popular than truth teachings nowadays. See, Jezebel is teaching things, but the reason that she's so popular in that church is not because her teaching is so biblical, it's because it allows sin. So be just like in our days. Someone comes, becomes very popular because they say, you can be a faithful Christian and a porn addict. You can be a faithful Christian and an adulterer. You can be a faithful Christian and a fornicator. You can have both. God doesn't judge and we shouldn't judge and people in the church shouldn't judge. That's what grace is for and mercy is for, brother. And if anybody tells you any different, they should be tolerant. Because, hey, watch those who judge people because they sin differently than you. And Jesus comes and says, this is what I have against you. You tolerate all that nonsense. See, let us not change the word of God. Let the word of God change us. See, there's a price to pay for the faithfulness to the God of the Bible. See, back then there was these idol cults, these prestigious clubs, and you paid a price to be a part of it. So this woman comes along named Jezebel and says, you can have both. You don't need to pick and choose between faithfulness to Jesus and comfort and convenience and being part of this club. You can have your comfort and your convenience and you can have Christ. As long as you learn balance. I mean, how many people wouldn't raise their hand if someone would come in and say, hey, you can have all your fleshly desires and Jesus. Sign me up. You never have to repent. You never have to change. Just say this prayer. I'm down. So a lot of people say, I'll, I'll worship Jesus and all my false religion and all my false gods and all my false stuff. I'll give money to my idols and then if I have some left, I'll give to church. I'll go to church and hear about all the sexual purity and stuff, but if the idols are having some kind of crazy event, I'm down for that too. Because you know, hey, nobody's perfect. It's a sin for Christians to be more tolerant than Christ was. And Christ says, I have this against you, you tolerate. A lot of people are more tolerant than Jesus. But listen, this is the bottom line. Not everybody's going to heaven. Not all religions lead to the same path, regardless of what Joel Osteen and Oprah say. Not all saviors can save. Not all sacred books lead to the same enlightenment. So, brother, you saying we got to be intolerant of everything? Well, what about legal tolerance and culture? Should we practice legal tolerance and culture? Meaning, should we believe that Muslims have the right to worship? Jehovah's Witness, 
Mormons, Buddhists, atheists, agnostics. Yeah. We should believe that they have the right to worship whoever they want. We live in a country, what does it say, the First Amendment? Of the right of free speech and you have the right to worship whoever you please. Should we have a legal tolerance of other views, other religions, other ideologies, and other perspectives? Yeah. Because Christianity is not a religion. It's not a belief system that's to be imposed on somebody. It's a relationship. It can't be like the Muslim countries where you have to be Muslim. You cannot pass a law and say, everybody has to be Christian. Or you put to death. See, that's why this country is not a Christian nation. Because if this country was a Christian nation, everybody had to be Christian. You wouldn't have atheists, agnostics. You wouldn't have Muslims. You wouldn't have Satanists. You wouldn't have Jehovah's Witnesses. You wouldn't have Mormons. You wouldn't have anything else. You had to be Christian. And if you weren't Christian, you'd be arrested and put to death. Because if you go to a Muslim nation and you're a Christian, even though you're a nine-year-old boy, they'll tie you to a tree and set you on fire. That's what happens in a Muslim nation. So do we want some kind of religion, religious legal tolerance here in the United States? Yeah, we do. Because what if they decide tomorrow that, okay, we're not going to have religious tolerance here. Everybody has to be Satanists. There we would be screaming for religious tolerance. Because Christianity is all about loving Jesus. You can't simply pass a law that says, everybody love Jesus. What about social tolerance in a community? Meaning if you have a family member who disagrees with you and with what you believe, or a co-worker or a neighbor that disagrees with what you believe, or maybe that they hold on to a different religion, a different spirituality, or spirituality or ideological belief system, whether they're an atheist or an agnostic, should we tolerate them sociably and personally? Yeah. We should. What does Jesus say? Love your what? You can tolerate somebody and not condone what they do. It doesn't say, only if they agree with you, love them. Because you know what? By your loving them, guess what? You might win them over. But going, you're going to hell. Everything you do is wrong. You're going to hell. You know what you believe and everything you believe is wrong. If it's not in the Bible, you're going to hell. Who wants that? I never met anybody who goes, yes, sign me up for that. That's the order. I don't want that. Yeah. Where do I sign? Jesus doesn't say agree with them. He says love them. So you should love, serve, be friends with all your neighbors of all different beliefs and ideological belief systems and religions and perspectives. Because Jesus says, love your neighbor. So yes, we should practice social tolerance. It's the equivalent of, oh, you're not a Christian? And your house is on fire? Oh well. I'm not calling the fire for a message you get for not loving Jesus. See what I'm saying? You got to be tolerant of another person's beliefs. Doesn't mean you agree with it. What about theological tolerance in the church? To a degree. There's some people who 
who believe in a lot of open-handed issues that really aren't heaven or hell issues, who doesn't take away the deity of Christ or anything, then it's okay. If you believe, hey, pre-trib rapture, that's fine. If you believe mid-trib rapture, that's fine. Post-trib rapture, there you go, fine again. If you believe all we should sing is hymns, or all we should do is contemporary, it's fine. Totally fine. All we should use is the HCSB version. Or I think that this version's better. Fine. Totally fine. It's an open handed issue. It don't matter. It's not having a hell issue. We can talk about it. That's, that's open handed secondary issues. You can talk about it. You can disagree on it. And we can still worship together, and it's fine. You might think you're wrong, but hey. You might think I'm wrong, but hey, we can still worship together, okay? And the problem comes in is whenever people make secondary issues primary issues. When people take open-handed issues and make them close-handed issues. If you don't use the King James Version, you're going to hell. You just stepped into ridiculousness. Okay? So what about our local church partnering with other churches? Should we tolerate other churches? Yes. Okay? They may disagree with us on certain open-handed issues, but if they really love Jesus, believe the Bible, then they're family. Okay? So we need to be friendly to them for the sake of evangelism, partnering with them so that other people might see Jesus. And then we can lovingly have a discussion about things that we might not agree on, and it's fine. But we do not tolerate heretical beliefs and partner with churches who teach heretical beliefs. Just because a place has a church on the sign doesn't mean they're a true church. Okay, so that brings us to how about heretical tolerance in the church? See, there are certain beliefs about close-handed issues and open-handed issues. The Bible is God's word. Jesus is God's son. Jesus lived without sin. Jesus died on the cross in our place. Jesus rose as our savior. The Bible is the inerrant word of God. Jesus is the second part of the Trinity. Close-handed issues. Okay? Close-handed issues. Open-handed issues, you're Baptist, you're Lutheran, you're Presbyterian, symbols of God, you're Reformed, you're not Reformed. See, we could get along across the open-handed issues, but we have to protect the close-handed issues. Somebody comes along, they're teaching heresy, they're teaching that, hey, it's not by grace through faith that you are justified before the Lord. It is through works. Guess what? Heresy. You don't partner with those people. Heresy. Or they say, hey, Jesus isn't the second person of the Trinity. Jesus was the angel Michael. Heresy. You don't partner with those people. Hey, we don't believe in the Trinity. We believe in oneness. Heresy or not? Heresy. You don't partner with those people. Okay? So we have to protect the close-handed issues. Somebody comes along, they teach heresy, we don't partner with them. They're claiming to be a Christian. Now we're not talking about true Christians. We're talking about people who claim to be Christians, just like Jezebel was. They're teaching false doctrine. They're encouraging false thinking and false behavior. We don't tolerate that. Because here's what the Bible says. Sheep, shepherds, wolves. People are sheep. Pastors are shepherds. Jesus is the chief shepherd. And Satan sends in the wolves. Spiritual leaders who are powerful, influential, winsome, and evil are wolves. It would be very unloving to the sheep to tolerate wolves. And some will say... 
Man, Pastor Dexter gets fired up when he talks about wolves. Yeah, I do. The Bible gets kind of fired up about wolves too. Jesus got fired up about wolves. True shepherd will tend to get fired up whenever a wolf comes. When there are wolves, shepherds shoot the wolves. They point out the wolves, they take their staff, and they pop the wolf in the face with it. They don't say, come see. You see, wolfy, wolfy. Oh, look how beautiful your hair is. Wow, you're a big wolf. Look at those sharp teeth. Wow. Here's all the sheep. Go play. Go play. What kind of shepherd would do that? One who don't care about the sheep. See, we do that to the wolves. We, 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 we shoot the wolves. We point out to the wolves. We take their, this, our staff and we pop them in the face with it. Because we love the sheep. We sit there and we say, that teaching is not biblical. That's not right. This is heresy. What that person is teaching is heretical. What that person is teaching is not in the Bible. Don't listen to it. Don't buy their tapes. If it comes on the radio, turn it off. They're taking scripture out of context. It's because we love the sheep. Not because we mean and where you're just not tolerant of their beliefs. No, I'm not. I'm not. They're wrong. So do we allow wolves? No. Now again, non-Christians aren't wolves. Okay? Meaning the lost. Lost people aren't wolves. What we're talking about is people who claim to be a Christian and then they try to lead people astray and lead people away from true Christianity. <clears throat> Those who add things to salvation. And that's what was going on in Thyatira. He said, this is what I have against you. Not only are you good at loving people and helping people and doing good works, but you're also good at loving and helping the wolves. He says, keep on loving, keep on helping, but stop doing it to the wolves. Anytime a shepherd does that to a wolf, you don't really love the sheep. Let me end with this. Christianity be begins with tolerance and moves to repentance. Meaning it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you've done, come to Jesus just like you are. That's tolerance. But it doesn't stay there because then Jesus says, guess what? Now you've got to change. So it begins with tolerance and it moves to repentance. It moves to change. Jesus says, come to me and you're going to change. So the issue is, can we welcome people and tolerate them as they come in? Yes. Will we tolerate all of their beliefs and everything whenever they first come in? Yes. Will we allow them to teach? No. See, Christianity, like I said, starts with tolerance. Come as you are, and Jesus says, I'm going to change you. He will never call people to repentance if we never say the way you're thinking is wrong, the way you're acting is wrong, the lifestyle you've chosen is wrong, the identity you have embraced is wrong, the actions that you celebrate are the ones that you should be mourning. And if we, from this pulpit and from this church, teach that, then we are no longer shepherds and we are no longer Christians. We are no longer faithful. We then become cult leaders. We become heretics. We become apostate. And meanwhile, those in the culture will cheer us. Yay! The church embraced this. Finally, after 2,000 years, it finally caught up with society. And Jesus would come to us and rebuke us and say, this is what I have against you. You tolerate. 
So you can repent, and if you do, you'll be rewarded if it's not too late. You can say, yeah, I'm wrong. I've got to change. Jesus, help me. Jesus, change me. Forgive me of my sin. Change me from the inside out. You can say, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. What I'm thinking is wrong. Who I'm listening to is wrong. The books I'm reading are wrong. The arguments I have are wrong. Because my heart is wrong. Because I want to do whatever I want to do. And I don't care what anybody tells me. But Jesus loves us enough to tell us to stop. Hey, can you throw that back up? I want to touch on this real quick. Revelation. Two twenty seven. Two twenty seven. See whatever Jesus talks about justice and judgment. He talks about it. And he talks about sexual sin leading to sickness. You don't have to throw it up, but I'm gonna read it. Right before that he talks about Jezebel. And those who, who don't repent, who's with her, who don't want to repent of, her, of their sexual immorality, look, I would throw her into a sick bed with those who commit adultery with her in the great tribulation unless they repent of her practices. So he talks about the, spirit, the sexual sin leading to sickness. Spiritual adultery leads to death and war with God. See, that's the language and the imagery of the time. In that day, it was customary when two nations would go to war, the king would assemble his people, and he would make a vase or a clay jar, and he would write the name of the opposing kingdom on the jar and act publicly as a declaration of war. He would slam it on the ground, and it would shatter to a million pieces. And it's saying that, and he will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my father, I also give him the morning star. That meant we're off to war whenever you saw a king do that. So sin, unrepentant sin is declaring war on God. And here Jesus is saying, if you don't repent, I'm writing your name on this clay pot and we're going to go to war. And I don't think any of us wants to go to war with Jesus. But what we need to do is make a clay pot. And write down our sins on it and go to war with our sin and repent of it. Amen? Amen? So Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you, God, that we can repent. We thank you for the gift of repentance. We thank you, God, that you put in us some strong leaders here that are not Ahabs. Lord God, that won't tolerate Jezebel or her spirit. Lord God, we thank you, God, that we stand up for sexual... Uh, we don't stand... And allow sexual immorality, Lord God, but we preach against it, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that we allow you, Lord God, your spirit to do your work in our hearts. Convicting us of sin and allowing us to preach the truth of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.